Here we are back in our new series, the book of Hebrews. New priesthood, new hope, new covenant. Let's quickly go over what we went over last week so that we can march forward together on the same page. Whatever tryptophan we have ingested into our systems should have worn off by now, so I will expect your rapt attention on the word of God. Well, we talked about angels last week. Hebrews 1 goes into a lot of information about angels, all manner of angels. We talked about standard angels, magnificent warrior angels, the Los Angeles angels, not so magnificent, uh, not touched by an angel, and of course, Charlie's angels, everyone's favorite angels. Um, we spoke of the author of Hebrews making an argument that the Lord, Yeshua, that the Son, Remember, Yeshua has his name hasn't come up yet. Neither has the term Christ or Messiah. Simply, Son. And the Son has a superior name to the angels. He has a superior position to the angels. He has superior authority to the angels. The angels are God's servants, but he is God's Son, and the angels are supernatural beings. And he is deity. We saw several quotations linked together, all uh, 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 stacked to make the argument that he has laid out in this outline. So the sun having become a much better, having... Uh, become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. His reputation is much greater in the cosmos. Uh, but to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? This, of course, comes from uh, the famous Psalm 2. And, whoops, uh, and uh, you are my son, today I've begotten you. This is something that our Father says to no one else, no angels, no one else, but to the Davidic king and to the ultimate Davidic king, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. This is particularly important because it references the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant is an extremely important concept to be able to hang on to, for not only for this book, but through the entirety of both Hebrew Bible and New Testament, the Davidic Covenant, is monumental and staggering in its significance. It is an agreement. It is a basket of promises, unconditional promises. They do not depend on David or on uh, his progeny's behavior. They are simply guarantees that God makes to David and to his dynasty. And it is three guarantees. One is the guarantee of a perpetual dynasty. The second guarantee is of a, an unshakable kingdom. And the third guarantee is that of an eternal throne. It becomes clear as time passes from David forward and we see the Messiah and we see his death, burial, and resurrection, it becomes obviously instantly clear how the puzzle pieces fit together and a perpetual dynasty, unshakable kingdom, and an eternal throne 
are all dependent upon an immortal descendant of David, one who has died, come back to life, never again to taste or face death. That is where we left it. Oh, actually, we left it with this one. And when he again brings the firstborn, that's the prototokos, the firstborn, the, uh, the premier over all creation. He said, because, which makes sense because he is the one who actually created everything and in him all things are held together. And he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. All the angels of God. Considering the preceding quotations, we can understand that this refers to the coming of the Davidic king to take his throne. And this will be the second advent of the Son. The second coming of of, our, of the Son, let all the angels of God worship him. Moving forward to the fourth quotation, this is new material. And of the angels, he says, remember what the author is doing, he's stringing together a series of separate Hebrew Bible passages, mostly from the Psalms, in order to make his case. He's not using the Hebrew Bible to bolster his case. The Hebrew Bible actually is his case, and they're like a string of pearls laid out for us. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. This emphasizes the changeable nature of angels who is God's servants serving at his whim, can become elemental forces of wind or fire as he requires. The sun, however, does not change. He is who he is. He makes the winds his messengers Flaming fire, his ministers. The fifth quotation. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter, his, the righteous scepter is the scepter of his Kingdom, what is being quoted here? First of all, when we think about someone on the throne ruling, he has a scepter. That is uh, not the son, that's a Caesar. But he has a scepter, and his righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom because he is ruling on the throne of his father David, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Now, it's easy to miss what it actually says. Ah. <sighs> In the target, well, you know what? I can't read that. It's too far, and this screen is out. So I'm simply going to go back to the passage, and we'll just read the passage. Trust me when I say that the Jewish Targum of this passage, uh, the Aramaic paraphrase, speaks of this figure as the Messiah. In other words, it's going to interpret it just like the author of Hebrews is interpreting it of the Messiah, just as I am going to bring out in this passage. It was just another piece of evidence, which sadly, uh, because of the distance, I cannot read. So, 
Let's go back to the passage because this is important. This is Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. We come to a problem right here in this verse because of the grammar. This is one of those, we see, uh, we see a we the, the, the type of psalm is a wedding psalm. It uses wedding imagery and was most likely, at least scholars uh, posit, that it was most likely composed on the, uh, for the event of a royal wedding. These are royal wedding psalms. It's a whole genre unto itself. But nestled snugly within this psalm is an audacious assertion concerning the identity of the king. Specifically, the fact that he has a divine nature. The king very matter-of-factly, no, how do you do, just stated audaciously, but straightforwardly, your throne, O oh God, is forever. And everyone maybe he's talking about God, a God in the heavens, even though for the past few verses he's been speaking about the Davidic king. But now, maybe he was speaking about the Davidic king, but he's speaking now about God ruling from the heavens. But then, who is the his of his kingdom? The his of his kingdom always refers to the Lord, the righteous scepter, the scepter of the heavenly kingdom, in other words. So, grammatically, I got a conundrum. Who's sitting on that throne? It's someone that the author of the psalm calls, O oh God. And that throne is forever and ever. Now, surely, in light of the Davidic covenant and the eternal throne, you're beginning to make some connections and seeing how this imagery works and what's actually at play here. This is clearly an individual distinguished from God himself. And I'll show you why. Because you, the fellow on the throne, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So, it's very clear to see that conundrum. You have a figure called God, recognized as God, sitting on the throne. And then you have the statement that regarding this figure on the throne, known as God, you have the God, your, the God of this fellow, has anointed you with oil... Do you have two powers? Do you have two gods? What's happening here? You have a very clear and audacious statement, although wrapped in ambiguity at this stage of progressive revelation, that somehow the Davidic king um, can appropriately, or at least a future Davidic king, can appropriately be refer to himself as God. Now, the author of Hebrews recognizes the extraordinary nature of this passage. Otherwise, he wouldn't have included, uh, included it. It embellishes his argument. The revelatory light of the New Testament regarding messianic incarnation, that the God, the Son, could become man, the Son, not only of God, but of David? Well, there's no ambiguity left now. No hint of hyperbole in the psalm calling this king deity. Psalm 45, as I was trying to show you with that quotation from the Targum, 
it is interpreted as well by the ancient rabbis through a messianic lens. Although they were reticent to truly ascribe to the messianic figure the idea of deity. They recognize Messiah there, but they're a little bit uh, more parsimonious in assigning deity and recognizing deity to that figure. Well, this is really one of a handful of passages in the New Testament, uh, John's Gospel being probably the premier in which the casual reader just, yeah, I'm just minding my business. I'm just loping along and I'm reading. And you wind up being shocked by the reminder that the authors were, they were rarely coy. And sometimes they were marvelously straightforward and forthright in not only asserting Jesus' deity, but in actually calling him, God. We must see that the king's throne can endure forever through the eternal duration of the Davidic son himself, who also is God's son, the second person of the Trinity. I don't know how you can avoid concluding that Jesus is deity, or at least the authors claim that Jesus is deity by the author of Hebrews' use. And, oh Lord, uh, well, I'm going to read it here, right here in this TV. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens, are the works of your hands. This is the next psalm, Psalm 102. They will perish, but you remain. What will perish? The heavens, the foundation of the earth, all the cosmos, They'll perish, you'll remain. They'll all become old, like a garment I have here. An old garment, hard to, hard to tell, right? What is that? It was a tunic 2,000 years ago. Sound is part of the Qumran discovery. You see going... Down the tunic are two broad lines. Right? Clothing. Even the finest, fanciest tunics and clothing will all wear away. They will become old like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. You have here this person, this woman, wearing a mantle. I was going to use a Jedi because they have the same concept, but I thought I'd use this ancient uh, picture. A mantle, a co head covering. It will be rolled up like a garment. They will also be changed. But you are the same. Your years will not come to an end. The Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Of old, you founded the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. All of them will wear out. Like a garment, like clothing, they will, you will change them. They will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will not come to an end. We're building on a theme here. The eternal duration of the sun. 
The author of Hebrews recognizes with the rabbinic literature that this psalm references the messianic age. He already had established that the Son is the instrument of creation. Made that point. What's the emphasis here? It's on comparing the, the temporary, finite nature of creation on the one hand, with on the other hand the immortal, infinite nature of the Son. What this leads us to conclude is that the clock of creation is running down. Time is running out for the earth as we know it. The earth's life is indeed finite. It has an expiration date. But the countdown of the earth's finish is not due to the Lord's impatience. And it's not due to the fact that he set some arbitrary deadline. And it's not due to the fact that he's got some urgent appointment somewhere to be. Time is not the fundamental issue. The concept of time. The concept that's expressed here is that of being old, ancient, worn out, like that garment that we saw. Based upon this passage, the earth, indeed the universe, has a most definite shelf life. When we think about shelf lives, I think all of us, in this room, and I know especially you watching at home can testify that from personal experience we can pinpoint the exact year when our lives went from, well, just measuring the normative advancement of consecutive years. Let's say, in my case, from birth all the way through year 39. But when I hit 40, it ceased becoming just a counting of numbers, time passing, the process of wearing out began to be felt at least, perceived by me, at age 40. And at some point, eventually, at a far distant moment, a long, long time from now, will culminate in my becoming ancient. Well, we all have to do that. We all dance that dance if the Lord doesn't return. But bottom line, all of creation has a built-in shelf life. By divine design, you cannot avoid the contemporary international hand-wringing over the Earth's, shall we say, shifting atmospheric conditions. Hebrews reminds us that even heroic efforts to perpetually preserve the Earth are futile. The attempt to regulate our collective uh, carbon footprint on behalf of Mama Earth, it's a losing battle with no long-term prospects of success. So think about what you want to dedicate your life to. Do you want to dedicate yourself to something that is indeed even now becoming worn out with a shelf life? Or do you want to dedicate 
every ounce and fiber of your being to the one who is eternal, the one who made creation. Our creator remains the same. Yesterday, today, forever. From his yesterdays, in eternity past, God has planned out not only our todays, but our forevers. Your life may be in good hands with the insurance company, but it's in the finest of hands when you trust the Lord. Well, I like the imagery that is used here in the, uh, in the psalm. It's a vibrant portrait. Old clothing. Well, I'm just going through uh, my father, rest in peace, uh, his uh, clothing, and a good portion of it folded up, rolled up, and placed in garbage bags to be donated. Clothing, rolled up, disposed of by the owner. And the entire, according to the author of Hebrews and the psalm, the entire space-time continuum, the earth, the heavens, every bit of history as we know it, will one day likewise be rolled up, tossed away, and replaced with something far beyond our imagination. Take a look. It's life is finite. Yours, however, because of the sun, your lives infinite. This body may be cast off, but who we are, our essence, who God created us to be, eternal, forever. And one day we'll have revamped bodies, resurrection bodies, glorified bodies to go along into eternity. Well, now he's wrapping up with a final quotation. And we've seen this one before. This comes from Psalm 110. Again, uh, the most commonly quoted passage from the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Yeshua uh, quoted it several times himself. But to which this is the punctuation here. To which of the angels... Has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Combination of the repeated quotation twice in one chapter. Not only well, the question in quotation not only provides a balance to his argument, the open and close of that first chapter, but it conclusively reinforces the son's superiority, in this case, over angels. The angels are ministering spirits. They're still hard at work. For whom? Who are they working for? They actually hard at work on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. God is employing them on our behalf at his direction. But the Son, once again, is pictured as seated and addressed What's he waiting for? He's awaiting his future reign 
following his father's final conquest of the son's enemies. That moment is coming as we watch the news, as we see media. We see, is there not justice in this world? Why are so many things all at once going wrong? And few, if any, seem to be definitively addressed. The promise of this simple passage is not even the main point of this passage, but it's an object that we can grasp and take away, is that it will not always be as it is today, and that there is coming a time when justice, not social justice, not racial justice, not justice with any kind of qualification prior to the word itself. When true justice, by which I mean justice by definition, i.e., ipso fatso, God's justice, will be seen, will be heard, will be felt, and will be definitively experienced. Following that, the Son will return and take his seat, not at the right hand of the Father, but the seat of his father, David. And as David did from Jerusalem 3,000 years ago, the Son will rule from Jerusalem over the entirety of the earth. The angels will bow before him and praise his name. Every knee, every tongue will confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord. See here, once again, I show you the picture. That's the imagery. Sit at my right side until I make your enemies the footstool. King's head footstools. I have a footrest under my desk while I do the computer. Do you? It's nice. I have cushy ones, not hard ones like those. I have cushy foam. But there comes a day when God will make the son's enemies a footstool for his feet as this frieze from the British Museum, the Assyrians, Tiglath, Pileser, his foot on his vanquished enemy is laid out before us. The Lord says to my Lord, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Will you inherit salvation? According to the New Testament, if you trust in the Messiah, in the Son, if you believe what the Son has done for you is sufficient, his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf, making reconciliation with the Father, if you trust, believe, have faith, <coughs> you will inherit salvation. When the earth is wrapped up and tossed in God's round file, swish, we conversely inherit salvation. So we see the superiority of Jesus as laid out in chapter 1 over angels. One, 
He has a superior name. Two, he's a superior position. Three, he's a superior authority. Four, the measure of servant versus son. Son trumps servant every time. Same <coughs> measure regarding supernatural beings and deity. Deity is always superior to just your run-of-the-mill supernatural beings, even fancy-schmancy ones like the angels. So what? What difference does the superiority of the sun over angels, what difference does that make to us? Well, there is a definitive answer that the author of Hebrews gives. This magnificent passage, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, coming out of nowhere, but quite apropos, is a warning. After all that glorious uh, exposition, after all that magnificent stringing of Hebrew scriptures to glorify the Son, the author moves immediately to a warning. A warning regarding what? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you in suspense. We'll pick up that warning next time.